on World News Tonight. Final push. President Biden revealed a historic new spending plan. Criminal investigations. Ukraine cracks down on fake vaccination certificates. Zuckerberg's announcement. Social media giant makes a big change as they unveil a new name. Frankie the Dino. A ferocious and talkative dino passes on a message to think about. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On today's coverage, we start off from the United States. President Joe Biden said he had secured a new $1.75 trillion framework for economic and climate change spending that could pass the Senate. But progressive House Democrats say they need to see the plan in writing before they jump on board. After struggling with Democratic divisions over his multi-trillion dollar spending plans, this morning President Biden unveiling a new framework and urging Democrats to get his agenda back on track. After months of tough and thoughtful negotiations, I think we have an historic, I know we have a historic economic framework. Delaying his departure for key summits in Europe, the president first traveled to Capitol Hill. A source familiar with the meeting said he warned Democrats behind closed doors, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that the House and Senate majorities and my presidency will be determined by what happens in the next week. Back at the White House, the president made his case. No one got everything they wanted, including me. But that's what compromise is. That's consensus. And that's what I ran on. The price tag of the social policy and climate plan, $1.75 trillion. It includes funding for universal pre-K, elder care, and a one-year extension of the enhanced child tax credit. But to cut the price tag down, many items were dropped, including free community college, prescription drug reform, and paid family and medical leave, a key proposal the president had been touting just last week. We're one of the few industrial countries in the world that does not have paid leave. Progressives had demanded a framework on the social spending and climate plan before they would support the bipartisan infrastructure bill. And tonight, some blasting the president's proposal, saying there were too many cuts. Many progressives saying they still don't trust moderate holdouts, Senators Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, who today suggested the price tag was not too high. We negotiated a good, uh, a good number that we've worked on. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi still not saying when she'll call a vote. Tensions are rising between France and the UK on the fishing row. Britain's government said it would summon France's ambassador to London to protest against France's actions in a post-Brexit fishing dispute. In the French port of Granville, the atmosphere is one of concern and resignation. Fishermen here who've plied the English Channel and the waters around Jersey for generations are the frontline victims of the worsening diplomatic war between the UK and France. That's what it comes down to, fishing licenses in the post-Brexit era. The United Kingdom says it's granted them to vessels that have a proven track record of fishing in its waters, while France insists London's only granted half of what it's entitled to and Paris has been dialing up the heat. After warning it would close several French ports to British vessels, boost customs and health controls on British goods, and possibly even raise the price of the electricity it sells to the British islands of Jersey and Guernsey, France fined two fishing boats for operating without a license of their own and detained one at a French port. It pushed British authorities to summon the French ambassador for an explanation. Europe is watching carefully. An EU spokesperson said the bloc would be pursuing discussions with both the UK and France in the days ahead to try and defuse the dispute. Ahead of their summit this weekend, the leaders of the G20 economies have largely agreed to on the need to take urgent action to tackle what they call the existential challenge of climate change. G20 leaders who are scheduled to meet in Rome for a two-day summit beginning Saturday have reportedly agreed to take, quote, immediate action to maintain the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. According to an 11-page draft statement seen by Reuters, the leaders shared the view that they would stop funding foreign coal-fired plants. On domestic coal, the draft includes leaders' pledges to do their utmost to avoid building new unabated coal power generation capacity, taking their own national circumstances into account. 
They also acknowledge the relevance of achieving global net zero greenhouse gas emissions or carbon neutrality going forward. The statement also says they will reduce global methane emissions by at least 30 percent below 2020 levels by 2030. The leaders agreed also on achieving an annual 100 billion U.S. dollar target for climate financing for developing countries, but the details have yet to be detailed. The statement is seen as a key stepping stone ahead of a broader U.N. climate summit next week in Glasgow. While the leaders of the G20 economies agreed on what they described the quote existential challenge of climate change, some areas remain points of contention. Security forces clashed with protesters furious over a military coup that derailed a fragile transition to democracy and sparked an international outcry. Even whilst mourning their dead, Sudanese protesters are undeterred. Demands are building for the army to reverse Monday's coup. When de facto leader General Abdel Fateh al burhan dissolved the country's transition towards democracy, sparking mass street clashes between protesters and security forces. Sudan's ruling military have tightened their crackdown on pro-democracy protesters and sacked six ambassadors supposedly due to their rejection of the military takeover. I announce very clearly that I will not recognize the decision from the coup leader, which has, in a single night, deposed the constitutionally legitimate government. Pro-democracy movements are mobilizing calls for a million strong protest come Saturday and international pressure is mounting. The African Union announced Sudan's suspension from the bloc until the civilian-led transition government is restored. And in a statement released Thursday, the UN Security Council affirmed its readiness to support Sudan's democratic transition, as the US and World Bank have both frozen the country's aid. General Burhan claims his actions were to prevent a civil war and has vowed elections will take place in the summer of 2023. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now on to the updates of the COVID pandemic. The World Health Organization and other aid groups appeal to leaders of the world's 20 biggest economies to fund a $23.4 billion plan to bring COVID-19 vaccines, tests and drugs to poorer countries in the next 12 months. As Hungary experiences a sharp spike in COVID cases, hospitalizations and deaths, the government is introducing new measures aimed at increasing vaccination rates, which have been stagnant for several months. The rise in cases is being replicated in several European countries, prompting concern from the WHO. The global number of reported cases and deaths from COVID-19 is now increasing for the first time in two months, driven by an ongoing rise in Europe that outweighs declines in other regions. Officials say the surge in cases can be partly attributed to low vaccination rates in Eastern Europe and Russia, where a partial lockdown has begun in Moscow. Romania is one of several countries reporting record numbers of deaths and infections, prompting it to seek help from its European neighbours. Doctors and medical equipment have been arriving from Denmark to help treat critically ill patients. Intensive care units are also under pressure in neighbouring Bulgaria, which has had the EU's highest COVID mortality rate for the past two weeks. It also has one of the bloc's lowest vaccination rates. The government is imposing a mandatory health pass on indoor entertainment venues, a move that's drawn anger from restaurant and hospitality workers who took to the streets of several cities on Thursday. As cases are plummeting in the US, hundreds of New York City Fire Department or the FDNY workers stage a protest outside the mayor's residence over the city vaccination mandate. For more on this, we have other there in the world news special correspondent Nicola Senaratna, who joins us now from New York in the United States. Nicola. Yes, Samuel Adi. Last week, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio gave some 50,000 employees of New York City a deadline to submit a proof of vaccination against COVID-19. Those who fail to show proof risk being sent home without pay. The FDNY has about 17,000 employees 
including emergency medical staff, firefighters, and civilian employees. The protest took place outside Gracia Mansion, the official mayor residence of New York City. Some called the mandate an infringement on their personal liberties based on current vaccination and the threat of unpaid leave the city could see a 20 percent of units close and fewer ambulances on the road the fdny says it plans to mitigate staffing shortages by enforcing mandatory overtime cancelling vacations and resigning employees to other roads a new york state judge denied a police union request to temporarily block the mandate. The Police Benevolent Association, which filed a lawsuit against the vaccine mandate, said that the union would appeal Wednesday's decision by the state Supreme Court judge. Back to you, Anurabi. All right, thank you. That was other there in the world news. Special correspondent Nicola Senaratna reporting from New York in the United States. Britain is to remove the last seven countries on its coronavirus red list, which currently requires newly arrived travelers from these destinations to spend 10 days in hotel quarantine. Let's cross over to other there in the world news. Special correspondent Dilini Senaratna reporting now from London in the UK for more. Dilini? Yes, Senaratna. Fully vaccinated arrivals from Ecuador, the Dominican Republic, Colombia, Peru, Panama, Haiti and Venezuela will no longer have to quarantine in a hotel. But the red list system will be kept in place and a country will be added back on the list if cases rise there. The changes announced by the Department for Transport will apply to passengers arriving in all four nations in the UK. Transport Secretary Grant Shapps said it was a good boost for travel and all those people employed in the travel sector. The list of nations and territories whose COVID vaccinations are recognised by the UK is also being expanded and will now include more than 135 countries in total. The governments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland confirmed they would also like to be adopting the changes following the initial announcement by the DFT for passengers arriving in England. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was other there in the World News Special Correspondent Dilini Seneviratna reporting from London in the UK. Ukrainian authorities are clamping down on a flourishing black market in forged vaccine and test documents as the country experiences some of the highest death rates from COVID-19 in the world. This is the moment Ukrainian police raided a doctor's surgery that is allegedly involved in a flourishing black market in forged vaccine and COVID-19 test certificates. This operation is just one of hundreds of criminal investigations publicized by the authorities. In another case, law enforcement caught a man hawking fake vaccine certifications on social media. Charging $114, he would arrange for a doctor to enter people's names as vaccinated on the national database, according to a statement by the prosecutor general's office. The government has made shots compulsory for some state employees and unvaccinated citizens face restrictions in certain venues. These new rules provided more incentive for those who do not want vaccines to get fake ones. Tatiana Makhailovska, head doctor at the Infectious Diseases Department at Kiev Hospital No. 3, said buying those certificates was, quote, probably the worst crime committed against the country and our society. Ukraine is experiencing some of the highest death rates in COVID-19 in the world. It lagged behind its neighbours in procuring vaccines earlier this year. And now it is struggling to persuade a sceptical population to take them. Only around 7 million out of 41 million Ukrainians are fully inoculated against COVID-19. Surveys also suggest around half of the adults do not want to be vaccinated. Johnson & Johnson is highlighted in the latest COVID-19 vaccine news after it found that some 50 million doses sitting idly in its Baltimore facility are waiting to be distributed. As many as 50 million doses of Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine made earlier this year may be sitting idle in a Baltimore plant, awaiting a green light to ship from U.S. regulators. That's according to two sources familiar with the situation who asked not to be named because they were not authorized to speak publicly about it. 
The Baltimore facility is run by Emergent Biosolutions, contracted by J&J to make vaccines. But the plant was forced to halt shipments in April after the U.S. Food and Drug Administration found the J&J vaccines were tainted with material from AstraZeneca's COVID-19 shots, also being manufactured there at the time. The contamination ruined about 15 million J&J doses and set back its U.S. vaccine rollout by weeks. The FDA said in a statement that it conducted a limited inspection of emergence facility in July. A previous inspection turned up a raft of sanitary, safety, and poor manufacturing issues at the plant. The FDA must still authorize the plant before Emergent can ship the vaccines. The exact number of J&J doses now sitting idle in Baltimore cannot be determined. A source told Emergent only makes the raw vaccine substance and does not make vials filled with finished product. Following the Emergent plant shutdown, J&J lowered its production target for 2021 from around 1 billion doses to between 500 million and 600 million doses. It expects to be able to make 1 billion doses annually starting next year. J&J has not specified whether it needs Emergent to restart production to hit its 2022 target. Welcome back. And for more world news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Volkswagen reported a third quarter operating profit of $3.25 billion, down 12% versus last year as the sector continued to struggle with its global shortage of semiconductor chips. Supply chain woes cost Apple $6 billion in sales during the company's fiscal fourth quarter, which missed Wall Street expectations. And Chief Executive Tim Cook said that the impact will be even worse during the current holiday sales quarter. The OECD Club of Leading Economies said in a report that the flow of immigrants to developed countries fell at its fastest pace ever at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic last year. The Russian capital bought in its strictest lockdown measures since June 2020 as hospitals confront a rising wave of coronavirus cases that has sent one-day pandemic deaths to record highs. Samsung Electronics reported its highest ever sales of 63 billion US dollars in the third quarter and the company's operating profit was the second biggest on record. Meanwhile, LG Electronics also saw record high sales of $16 billion. Facebook changed its parent company name to Meta as a tech giant tries to move past being a scandal-plagued social network to its virtual reality vision for the future. Rebranding critics have called this an effort of distraction from the platform's dysfunction. As he faces scrutiny from lawmakers and regulators at home and abroad, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg on Thursday announced a rebrand of the company he founded in 2004. Our company is now Meta. The name change comes as the world's largest social media company battles criticism over its market power, algorithm, and abuse on its platforms. Speaking at the company's live-streamed virtual and augmented reality conference, Zuckerberg said it reflects the company's ambition to build the metaverse, which it bets will be the successor to the mobile internet. And you're going to be able to do almost anything you can imagine. Get together with friends and family, work, learn, play, shop, create, as well as entirely new categories that don't really fit how we think about computers or phones today. A term coined in a dystopian novel three decades ago and now buzzing in Silicon Valley, Metaverse refers broadly to the idea of a shared virtual environment. Hi. Hi, Mark. What's up, Mark? The company, which has invested heavily in augmented and virtual reality, said the change would bring together its different apps and technologies under one new brand and would not change its corporate structure. With about 2.9 billion monthly users, the company has faced increased scrutiny. Especially after Facebook employee Frances Haugen leaked documents she said showed the company chose profit over user safety. Zuckerberg earlier this week said the documents were being used to paint a false picture. On Thursday, as Zuckerberg addressed the conference, the company unveiled a new sign at its headquarters in Menlo Park, California, replacing its thumbs up like logo with a blue infinity icon. Its stock ticker will also change to MVRS on December 1st, but the company's namesake social media service will continue to be called Facebook. And finally tonight, in a UNDP short film, a ferocious and talkative dinosaur bursts into the iconic General Assembly Hall at UN headquarters in New York with a special warning for any diplomats who still think climate action is for the birds. 
idea ahead of this year's UN Climate Change Summit, a computer-generated dinosaur bursts into the UN's famous General Assembly Hall in New York to tell world diplomats that uh, going extinct is a bad thing. You're headed for a climate disaster, the dinosaur proclaims. And yet, every year, governments spend hundreds of billions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. Imagine if we uh, spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. Let me be real for a second. You've got a huge opportunity right now. As you rebuild your economies and bounce back from this pandemic, this is humanity's big chance. So here's my wild idea. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. I'll be back again on Monday with another edition of World News. I'm Anradhi Vikramasinghe. Till then, stay safe and have a great weekend.